to be giving the presentation on my own. Ari had a illness in the family and she's not going to be able to get here. But we'll forgive her because she has a valued reason and all that sort of stuff. And now I can make fun of her with her not being here. And that makes me feel better anyway. Um, so let's see. Um, let me ask the question this way because what we're going to do is figure out a way to make threat intelligence sorry, not threat intelligence, makes security awareness more valuable. Because at the end of the day, let's face it, threat intelligence is not out there to provide better security and in and of itself. Threat intelligence theoretically helps you create a better security program. Awareness, frankly, is part of that program. Now, my question to you is how many people are here just because this is a good session, you get out of work early on in the afternoon and you get a better chance to go to the party without getting caught in traffic. Anybody for that? No. Now, how many people are here to learn about, more specifically about security awareness? Okay, how many people are here to learn more specifically about threat intelligence? Okay, how many people are, well, some of you, most of you raised your hands for both. How many people are here to learn about both and get a more well-rounded stuff? Okay, so we'll keep the presentation as it is. I might be go off on more tangents a little bit because I'm not going to go ahead because I have other presentations on how to create a, an effective security awareness presentation. You know, more than, you know, this is not... I shouldn't say, this is not how to create an effective security awareness program. This is kind of how to make your security awareness program more effective with the assumption that you have one in place. So along the way, what I'm going to try to do is, because honestly, when we give this presentation, usually we give this presentation and give or take about an hour. I have two hours to overwhelm you with fun and frolic. But in this case, what we're going to do is I'll probably go off on a few more tangents that's on the slides and maybe you know, add a little bit more about awareness along the way. And then perhaps, depending on if I don't take up the full amount of time, I'll bring up another presentation on how to make awareness programs more effective. For any lackings on the threat intelligence side, I apologize in advance, but again, we'll see what we can do and all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, anybody like Diet Mountain Dews? Because uh, if you do, just let me know, I'll get you here. I mean, because here's the thing, and a true story, so I was telling people this at lunch. Um, basically what happened was, one day, I was, well, I was speaking in, uh, where was it? Tennessee, Tennessee Valley Higher Education Commission. And I remember this distinctly, because what happened was, I had a drive to the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, because the Tennessee Valley Higher Education Commission had something in the middle of the state park where they had this wonderful, organize um, lodge and everything to hold events. So they asked me, it's like, Ira, we're really excited to have you. Is there anything you need for the presentation? I go, nothing. They're like, no, there must be something. I go, and then he's like, after a while, I go, okay, a pound of green and only green M&Ms. And the guy's like, okay, I thought he was laughing. So anyway, then I like go to Nashville, fly in in the morning, take this three hour drive to the middle of nowhere in Tennessee. I get there, then the guy's like, Huh, oh, we're really glad to have you. Oh, by the way, hold on, I got your M&Ms. I'm like, what M&Ms? He's like, the M&Ms you need. I'm like, I completely forgot. He's like, I can't wait to see what you're going to do with it. I go, neither can I. And then that is like the start. So then when people bother me, they're like, what do you need? I go, a pound of green and only green M&Ms. I just wish Richard had to go through more work. And then I also go, you know, two six pack of Diet Mountain Dew. So he got that. But I'm getting on a plane, so I can't go through all of it. So I'm happy to share both M&Ms and Diet Mountain Dews with all of you. But Diet Mountain Dews, that's the nectar of the gods. So that's it. And that, <laughs> I can't say that at RSA, because they even take the labels off of water. Like, you know, that's going to... Oh, that is water. That's an accident. It's like poison to me. Anyway, so, okay, so anyway, I've got to do this manually. So this is the nature of the presentation. Again, threat intelligence to improve awareness programs. Um, first off, here's Ari. I, how many people think Ari looks like Olivia Munn? Mm, one or two. Okay, never mind. Anyway, that's what Ari looks like. This is what Ari looks like when I make fun of her when she's not there saying I grabbed her picture off the Ashley Madison website. So anyway, okay, so let's start talking about security awareness. When I worked at NSA, I started telling the story about how 
Um, I hated my job at NSA. I mean, I really hated my job. Within three months, I was a senior analyst on the watch shift because everybody else more senior than me left by that point in time. So one of my responsibilities, being the senior analyst on the shift, was when we were working day shift, I had to train new people coming into the office. And you know there were a lot of them since everybody hated their job. And what happened was, one of the women coming in, her last name was Kirk, K-I-R-K, like Captain Kirk. And I'm like sitting there, I go, okay, log on to the system, great. Now you have to log into the database. Your database ID is gonna be your last name, Kirk, K-I-R-K. Now great, enter your password, Captain C-A-P-T-A-I-A. And then she turns around looking at me in horror going, how do you know what my password is? And I'm like, you've got to be kidding. And then she looks at me and goes, no, Captain's really my password. I'm like, oh, okay. And then she's like, oh, and by the way, my father was in the Army. At one point, he was a captain, so there really was a Captain Kirk. I'm like, whatever. Now, stop and think about it this way. This is a national security agency, world leader in information security. And everybody's like, wow, they must have the best security in the world. Yet, here's this woman who can figure out, because at NSA, you literally go through, and I'm not making this up, three days of security awareness training. That's your job. You come in, you get your badge, you sit in a room for eight hours a day for three days, learning, put your badge away. Don't, you know, if somebody asks your badge for a 15% discount for food, it's probably the Iranians who, literally, the Iranians did set up a restaurant that said, show your badge, get 15% off. You know, it's like government workers can't, I mean, even if they, yeah. well, I know it's a spy, but I still want that 15%. <laughs> Here's another thing, never split bills with government workers, I swear, you know, I mean, literally, you go to lunch with them, well, $6.95 for my thing, I got a drink, tax and tip, here's $8. I'm like, Never go out to lunch with government workers. So anyway, this is NSA. You learn this stuff. You learn everything, foreign intelligence, everything. And yet this woman sitting in there after a week, for the most part, of some of the theoretical, most intensive security awareness training can't figure out captains of password, a bad password for Kirk. Now, she sounds like a blithering idiot, right? And everybody laughs when I tell this story. I've been telling this story. God. I think she's actually dead now, so I might use a real name, but the fact of the matter is this woman has been giving fodder to the security community for more than a decade. She sounds like an idiot, but the reality is she was a graduate from Cornell University, Ivy League school. She was the smartest person in the office, except of course for me, and she couldn't even figure out this was a bad password. And then you stop and think, what's the real problem? The real problem with this is that they assumed she would know this. Everybody, everybody assumes, and like, I don't know how many people remember the old odd couple, now I'm really dating myself, you know, but if you assume you make an ass of you and me type of thing. Everybody's out there in the security profession, we're making asses of ourselves day in and day out because we're assuming users know these things. We're assuming users know not to reuse passwords. We're assuming users know not to click on phishing messages. We assume users know not to give out your password for chocolate bars and stuff like that. But users do that day in and day out, and it's a given. And this happened at NSA. Now, the problem is she sounds like a blithering idiot. The reality, though, is, and I came up with the same, because behind every stupid user is a stupider security professional. And the reason we're stupid is because we make assumptions. We make assumptions that people have common sense. The problem is there is no common sense without common knowledge. And unless you can ensure everybody throughout your organization has the same base of common knowledge implemented in the same way, it's not going to work. You know, you can go out and say, oh, nobody will use captain as a password on Kirk. Nobody will do this. They will. There are enough people out there to do that. And frankly, it's not just being stupid. It's not just being a blithering idiot. It's a fact of the matter that some people, and I will admit this, I have password on some accounts that I use. My password is literally my password. Why? Because in some cases, there's multi-factor authentication, so the password is irrelevant anyway. In other cases, the account just doesn't have any value to me. 
It's like if it's an account for, I don't know, like some websites in order to get your free subscription to see the full New York Times article, you need to enter a user ID and password. You know, might as well have password, because what are they going to do? They're going to go ahead and read the New York Times on my email address instead of their own? I don't care. But I make a conscious decision because I understand the value of things like that. Is it possible there might be some obscure you know, permutation that some hacker is going to use that to somehow steal nuclear secrets? I don't know. It's possible. But at the end of the day, it's not likely. It's just not worth it. But the average user doesn't know or understand this. So the thing is, again, whose fault it is? She's not an idiot. She's an Ivy League graduate. Nobody told her that. It's not unique, and again, it comes down to you can't have common, you can't have common knowledge without common sense. And too many security practitioners fail to realize this. They love to sit around. There was a string, actually, I think it's a Reddit string or whatever. I, this is my online ignorance, but I really don't know what Reddit is type of thing. I guess you can pose questions or whatever. Somebody had a string of stupid like user stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And somebody said, post your stupid user stories. And some stupid user, they had this admin going in, and it's like, yeah, this person got a wireless mouse and complained it didn't work. And then I asked them if they plugged in their dongle. They didn't know what a dongle meant. I mean, honestly, that's what he actually wrote on Reddit. I'm sitting there thinking, in the first place, you ask most people, where's their dongle? You might get arrested or something like that. <laughs> And here's this technology professional assuming people know what a dongle is. You know, assuming, because think about it this way. Um, what's another good one? Another, another person on that string came in and said, oh, this one user, they said the computer didn't work. You know, and it's not working. And I asked them if they turned it on. They're like, yeah, they turned it on. They turned on, you know, I'm like, what did you turn on? It's like, and they turned on the monitor. And it's like this person said the user didn't understand the difference between the monitor and the CPU, and you have to turn on the CPU. Isn't that a stupid user? And I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? I remember when you have PCs where you press a button on the keyboard and it turns on everything. I know there are even some PCs where the only thing there is it's an all-in-one computer and the monitor is the CPU and everything. That tells me you have an admin that doesn't realize the variability in hardware configurations, let alone this. Now stop and think, these are the people who are the front lines of taking security-related questions too. So there's a lot of arrogance in the security community and stuff like that that we have to overcome. So anyway, like I said, it's not stupid users, it's incompetent security professionals who don't know what the essence of their job is. Every time, and this is a critical thing that we're talking about with threat intelligence and everything else, when we start looking at this sort of stuff, we have to say, what did we learn from this incident? When, when there is an incident where we see a quote unquote stupid user, why was the user allowed to be stupid? Think about it that way. Because frankly, while I am clearly a fan of security awareness, I do not believe it is the fault of a failed security awareness program that a user can click on a single email and cripple the whole organization. If a single user can click an email and that alone can bring down your company, you're kind of screwed anyway. <laughs> and too many people are afraid to realize that they love to blame the stupid user. It's not the stupid user. Sometimes it's the admins thinking, it's like, wow, these users should know better. If you think a user should know better, you're the stupid admin. But more important than that, they've got to realize there's got to be depth in their awareness programs, there's got to be depth in their security programs, there's got to be depth in their intelligence programs, and so on. So now, a little bit more specifically about awareness training and things like this. Here's the problem that most people think about, you know, what awareness is like. They think what happens is once a year, the security department shows up and says you have to take the mandatory CBT training. And if you don't take the mandatory CBT training, you're going to be fired, you're not going to get promoted, you're not going to do whatever. Oh, and by the way, I refuse to acknowledge the new Star Wars as a real Star Wars, just for the record. You know, Kylo Ren is like a little wimp of the universe. So anyway, I just had to say that for some reason. So, <clears throat> yeah. So without that, but this is the impression. 
Yeah, but Kylo Ren fake get out of here. So, uh, but I mean, most of the time, this is really what can people think of. They think awareness is compliance training, and it is so not compliance training. Traditional security awareness programs, and this is where a lot of stuff kind of starts to fail. When you're looking at things, awareness programs, and why they're successful, why they're not, most awareness programs are failures from the start. In the first place, if you have a security awareness program, you're almost a failure by definition. Because seriously, secure, the real definition of security is freedom from risk. You're never, ever, ever going to be free from risk. Really, if you're a security professional, your job is not security. Your job is risk management. Your job is to go in there and consciously know what are the threats out there, what are my vulnerabilities, what vulnerabilities are most likely to be exploited, and then based on that, put a security program in place that most cost effectively mitigates the vulnerabilities likely to be exploited and cause the greatest risk. That's what a security professional does. Implement procedures to optimize, optimize risk management. And I don't say minimize risk, it's to optimize risk. Minimize risk means you want to get rid of every possible potential loss. You never, ever, ever want to do that. Why? Because it's stupid. Because you're going to start saying, because right now, in theory, an airplane could crash into this building and burn it down. That can happen. What's the reality of the actual likelihood of that? Near zero. But if I want to minimize my risk, I have to account for that. I don't want to account for that. You have to account for reasonable things within your program. So when you start doing that, most people are out there, they look at security awareness and they say, okay, what's the traditional thing? I'm going to tell people, here's a problem. And then that's it. It's like I'm going to make them say, there are hackers out there who send phishing messages. It's like, okay, hackers send phishing messages. Thank you for that news flash. Don't click on phishing messages. Don't click on phishing messages? Uh, yeah, I, I'm bored today. I want to click on a phishing message for the hell of it. You can't tell people what to do, but generally they sit there, they force videos out, they put a poster out. The posters typically get put behind the copy machine. And then when they look behind the copy machine, they all look the same one month to the next. So when they actually take down the poster, put a new one up, nobody notices they change. They still think it's the same thing that says, you know, do not plug your modem into an outside phone line type of thing that they saw last time they looked at it. But, you know, they've got to go ahead. There's little tracking of the usage. And metrics, when they have metrics, what is it? How many people took the mandatory CBT training? You know, like if it's not 100%, you're kind of screwed. But it doesn't even say how many incidents are there. It doesn't say have I had more calls to the help desk, for example. Like so, for example, calls to the help desk about security are good. You think no, people are finding more incidents. It's no, you had the incidents. Now they know or where to know to report it. So anyway, it forces users to take training only pass fail. It focuses on specific topics that are random. And it's great for some environments. Again, you have a nice factory floor where people walk in, walk out, their computer is the same, they plug data in, they, they only use a computer to, tell what, to say what time they got into the factory, what time they left, great, that's enough. They have the same job day in, day out. They don't have a lot of interaction with new stuff where they can do things wrong. That's not the typical thing. I'm sorry, that's not the latest environment where awareness matters. Then you have other companies that do phishing simulations. Oh, sorry, I mean, I shouldn't say the companies do it, but that's their awareness program. And if you have an awareness program that focuses on phishing simulations and say, we did phishing simulations and we got our phishing simulations down from 20% down to 7%, aren't we great? It's like, no, you're completely clueless. Because <laughs> why? Phishing is not awareness. A phishing awareness program, and yes, let's face it, it is good to get phishing susceptibility down as low as possible. I am not in disagreement with that in any way, shape, or form. Where I have problems with this is, how does phishing simulation stop users from losing a USB drive? How does phishing simulation stop somebody from letting a tailgater in? How does phishing simulation stop people from reusing the same password on their personal accounts and their company accounts? How does phishing simulation stop people from entering insecure passwords? 
you've got to go ahead and you've got to realize fishing's important, but it's only as important as that one piece of awareness where users can do harm. And again, yes, it's important, but it's not what an awareness program should be. So now, what really is security awareness? There's a basic difference. In order to understand awareness and make effective awareness programs, and I keep coming over here, sorry for going back and forth, but there's people behind the pillar, so anyway. Not that I don't like you or you smell. I don't know if you smell. I didn't take any good accounts of that, but I just have to try to make sure. Um, but anyway, so real security awareness is essentially, there's a difference between awareness and training. Training, by definition, is providing people a fixed body of knowledge and maybe testing them on that. So I will tell you, a good password has at least eight characters, has numbers, letters, uppercase and lowercase, blah, 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 blah. And then you go ahead and when you take training, then you're like, we're gonna have a gamification of it. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna ask them a question after they watch our video. And then the question is, okay, does a good password have three or fewer characters, four to seven characters, or eight or more. You say eight or more characters, and it's congratulations, you're security aware, print up your certificate. That's gamification to most people. You know, how would you like to go to school kids and say, that's not a pop quiz you're taking, that's a pop game. It doesn't work. Gamification, this is a side issue just for sake of argument, um, just so you don't confuse it. Um, and this is one of those tangents going off. Gamification is incentive programs. It's not a game to provide information. And let me give you the difference. There's the ABCs of behavioral science. A is antecedent. Antecedent is the same as information. Antecedent, or information, feeds behavior, which cre or might create a behavior. The behavior generates a consequence. The consequence then feeds back into the behavior. So let me give you an example of this. Um, you go to a restaurant, and the server comes over and hands you a plate of food and says, the plate's hot. If you're like me, you go, I'm a man. Give me that plate. And as I'm singeing my fingers, putting it down, trying to act cool, I'm sitting there like, OK. And then I have my behavior. I have my consequence of singed fingers. Now, the next time, when the server comes over with my ice brownie ice cream sundae with chocolate ice cream and wants to put that down in front of me, I'm going to let them put that down in front of me. Why? Because I don't care if it's a brownie sundae, I want the rest of the skin staying on my fingers at this point. The reality, though, is when you look at most gamification programs, they provide a quote-unquote game to provide information. And let me tell you what the problem is. Did I, was I affected by the information of the server telling me my plate is hot? No. The average person, 20% of behaviors might be created by information. 80% of behaviors are created by consequence. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're like me, and you have a password of, let's say the average user goes inside your organization, and they have a password of password. So they, they have the information, they ignore the information, and they say the password's password. What is the consequence to that, them having that password? You don't know. Unless you run a password cracker and say, hey, you're out of compliance, there's no consequence. So what does that do? That is a consequence that encourages a bad behavior to continue. So what you want to do is you want to catch people in gamification and reward them to do the right thing. So if somebody calls up to report a security and says, you're like, great job, congratulations, we want to give you a cash award, or we want to at least want to acknowledge you and add that to your promotion file. That's a consequence of people doing good things. A consequence is somebody stops somebody from walking in, even if you create those situations artificially. If you have phishing simulations, the question isn't do they not click, the question, in my opinion, is, and you'll see why this is important in a few more slides, do they report the phishing message so you can go back and block the phishing message from users who are not as aware of them, and then reward people for reporting phishing messages? Because if people go ahead and report phishing incidents or report security incidents, and they never hear back, the consequence of doing the right thing is nothing. So why are they going to go out of their way to, for, no concept, you know, for no benefit? 
So again, we've got to understand that. But reality, what is awareness? Awareness is about changing behavior. You don't care if somebody consciously knows this. So for example, if you look at the, yeah, let's scare the hell out of people. So you have the garage downstairs. There can be bad people in the garage, right? It's a given. Now the thing is, if somebody goes down, do you want somebody to go down and be a lookout, search right, left, look for scenes, listen for possible people crawling around because in garages like that you can hear the echoing or whatever. Do you want these people, you know, to behave properly? They might know, theoretically, you might know, well, garages are dangerous places, potentially, but it's like, ah, no, this is a safe garage, and then they ignore it. No, you want people to actually behave in the right way. Now, with security, I'll use the password example. What's the difference? If awareness is creating actual behavior, how do I measure that? So if you go ahead, you give people a quiz, say, is a good password, how many characters is a good password? And they say, I know it's eight or more. The awareness perspective is, are they actually using a good password? Are they trying to use a good password? And the way I would potentially measure that is by running password trackers against the password file to see whether or not they actually are using good passwords. And when I try to create metrics for organizations, I don't say, tell me how many people know what the number of good characters are in a password. I say, let's run a password cracker and see if people do have good passwords. That's how you test for the root behavior. You don't ask people, do you know? Because again, you could be like me and you could know a password is a bad password. On the other hand, it doesn't mean I actually don't have password as my password. So again, for awareness, you're measuring and you're looking for improving behaviors. You're not providing information. Because providing information is useless. And let me actually, yeah, and the next slide covers this point. So most awareness programs are, they're training, they're not awareness. They usually rely upon a single training tool. So for example, I'm sure you know, if you're trying to teach your, let's say you have more than one child. More than one child, your children are not little clones of each other, no matter how much you would prefer them to be sometimes. What happens is they have different learning styles. One kid might like, you know, you're, like I have one kid, it's like, go up to your room. And it's like, okay, good. You know, it's like, I'm going to take away your TV. It's like, fine, I have my cell phone. You know, I'm going to like, I'll take that away. It's like, fine, I'll read a book. You can't punish this kid by sending him to his room by himself. On the other hand, you have another kid, and he's completely different. It's like you send him, it's like the mark of death to isolate him from other people. But here he is. But you've got to understand, it's the same thing with awareness. You can't rely upon a single mode of providing information. I don't want to say training, providing information. You're providing experiences, you're providing things. So for some people, if I tell people, and like, so some people, like older people, it is actually true that older people do prefer the standard newsletters and posters and things like that. Younger people, and again, like companies like Akamai and other companies are famous for like having Twitter feeds for security related information. Because younger people tend to like Twitter feeds, blog posts, and so on. So you got to go ahead and you can't rely upon a single training tool to get out the information. You need to provide a lot of information. You can't say, everybody took the CBT, so everybody has the same information. No, if you're like most companies, what happens is, and I'm not making this up, in one organization we were working with, they actually went ahead and they assigned the junior person in the office to take the mandatory training, write down the answers, and then give all that to everybody else so they could fast forward through the mandatory CBTs. That is the goodness of CBTs. And some people say, you can't do that because we have a game in there. And it's like, nah, you can do that. So anyway, you've got to worry about that sort of stuff. Providing information, again, measure short-term comprehension. Again, that's not an awareness program. That's a waste of people's time that make people hate you. Because I promise, security, one of the security people's biggest problems is they don't want to be perceived like Darth Vader walking in. You know, they want to go ahead and say, hey. There's a lot of security people they want. That's why they got it. Yeah, I know. Those are sociopaths. You know, <laughs> our, our profession has quite a few sociopaths, let's face it. Much more than we prefer. 
But those sociopaths love it. I, you know, it's like there was a joke about me being in the Marines. There was one guy where, like, I, was, I went through officer recruitment. I'm not making this up. So I went through officer recruitment. I had my private hotel room that they put me up the night before. I did, however, have to eat the buffet with all those little scummy enlisted recruit wannabes who had to share rooms, went out drinking the night before and everything else. And there was one guy who was the most obnoxious person there talking about how he signed up to be an MP and he's looking at busting people and being the soldier who puts the soldiers in their place. I'm like, God, I hope I'm your well, commanding officer. So I mean, that's why like, you really see, get scared about some of those people. But the reality is, so going back to this, information doesn't mean action. You've got to go ahead because good awareness has three components. Again, I mentioned the ABCs of behavioral science antecedent, which is really information, behavior, and consequence. And why is it that way? Antecedent, behavior, consequence. Because information, behavior, consequences is like irritable bowel syndrome or something. But it's ABCs. In this case, for good awareness, you have to understand there are three components for awareness to be impactful. One is you need to provide information about what you need to do. That's the first thing. You know, or you need information about what's the problem. You need to provide information about what is the action to account for the problem. But the most critical part is you need to provide the motivation to take the action. Because again, password training, I'll beat that one to death. Password training, if I tell you you need to have a good password, and it's like, well, why do you need bad people will try to get your account? And it's like, well, what's the motivation? It's like, I don't want bad people to get my account. It's like, yeah, I've had a bad password my whole life. There's no motivation. You know, motivation might be if we run a password crack, you have a bad password, you're going to be fired. That will get people motivated. I'm not saying you want the negative consequence, but sometimes you need it. There's other types of things motivating people. You can tell a few horror stories. I'm not a fan of scaring people into doing things, but sometimes scaring people into doing things might work. I really hate that. The worst thing I ever heard, by the way, um, some I watched security train, I heard this from a few people. I saw that train and I was afraid to check my email. I'm like, uh, you're the security manager, you should be fired. Because honestly, and here's a good thing, security is not about scaring people from doing their job. Security is about enabling people to securely do their job. If you are scaring people away from doing a normal business function, that's a really, really bad thing. Your job is to have people do their business function in a secure way, which actually goes to a different thing. Here's the problem, and let me give you, let me ask you a question. If I tell you, look at a phishing message, and if the email looks like it comes from a person and the address is not the accurate address, like it's like school, you know, like, it, like there's an O instead of a zero in the spelling of like, you know, a name of a, sorry, I can't use a name of, I'm trying to think of a company I can use. Let's say it's Facebook. You know, they'll never, they have better things to do than to sue me. But let's say it's Facebook and it's Facebook face B00K instead of B00K. And you say, look at that phishing message. That phishing message is from face B00K. So that, therefore, you know it's a phishing message. Well, what happens? The person looks at a message that comes in and says, hey, that email address looks okay. I'm going to click on the message like it's real. The problem with telling people don't do this, if you see this, is that it doesn't train them if they don't see the exact same case. Because here's what good awareness is. At the end of the day, good awareness is telling people what are the policies and procedures they're supposed to follow. It's not saying bad guys do this, so don't fall for it. They, there's some into it, but in the ideal world, what good awareness training is, Policy says, in order to implement, you know, policy says that when you open up a message, you should never download an attachment. Policy says you should not log in as the super user to enable mail to download or something. You don't say, well, phishing messages will send you bad things, so therefore don't click on it. You should be training people. You do not let people in the building without checking for a badge. You don't have to say, well, gee, hackers use social engineering and they might try to follow you in to steal your password. You say you should always check for a badge. You don't need to do this. Good awareness is not be afraid of the bad guys. Good awareness is here are the policies and procedures you're supposed to follow. And if you have good policies and procedures, that should stop the attacks generally. 
If you have bad policy and procedures, you might as well give up on awareness because you're screwed to begin with. Because good awareness, oh, sorry, good, and, and this actually comes under the category of governance. Too many people think governance is a stack of policies that somebody has to write that sit on a shelf. Good governance should be the embodiment and say this is the foundation of a good program. Because here's the problem that I see in most security programs. Somebody comes in, and it's a real, it's a friend of mine, and usually if he's a good friend, he's a good security practitioner. So a good security practitioner goes into an organization, says, my company is screwed up, I've got to go ahead, re-architect, I need you to run a pen test, I want you to do the awareness program, and so on. I love the guy. But here's the problem. The security program is going to suck if he leaves, if he doesn't have somebody to follow him. If you have governance, and frankly, it could also suck even if he's there, if he doesn't have executive, if he doesn't have executive support to give him the budget and the resources. What well, good governance says, assuming you do it right, or assuming it's implemented the way it should be, good governance says security is important. We're going to put the appropriate level of funding in. The appropriate level of funding is driven by these guidelines, the implementation of which has to be properly funded. So you have executive support saying the right resources are going to be there. You then have um, guidelines and you have procedures which specifically lay out the responsibilities of different departments such as how to securely configure servers, how to ensure people do the right functions when they get you know, packages into the office and stuff like that, how security guards should verify identities, and that should all be laid out. If it's not laid out like that, it's left completely the chance on the people who are inside the organization. And if it's left completely to chance, your security program is basically, sorry, I'm trying not to curse, your security program is basically screwed, and you can assume what I wanted to say otherwise. <coughs> because if you can't go ahead and specify the behavior of everybody in your organization from a security perspective, and it's left completely to chance of who's in charge and what sort of management they are funded, your security programs are completely random, and you're a failure by, de by IRIS definition. Anyway, comprehensive programs are more than training, it's more than fishing, it has to engage people proactively, and it has to take, and there is take as many modes as possible. So in other words, CBT, I, I look, I say CBT is not ideal. It's not ideal is the only method for providing information. If CBT is required for the auditors, great, and CBT might impact 25% of your people, but also maybe try to have events, maybe try to implement gamification. Maybe try to have like, you know, security awareness day, whole contest, provide information in newsletters, provide information in other forms. Again, as many things as possible. And ideally also have a timely program in place. So for here's a great thing. Frankly, right now, every organization should be saying, because this is all over the news right now. Every organization, like when I turned on the news, there was something that said more than a quarter million email addresses for Yahoo, Google, and everything have been hacked. How many security programs took advantage of that and said, look, here you've probably read in the news or seen on the news that somebody has hacked more than a quarter million or, or a quarter billion email addresses. What does that mean to you? Frankly, it should mean if you change your password regularly, you will not have a problem. In your personal lives, as well as in your business life, please change your password regularly. What does that do? It addresses a concern that's immediate to them. It addresses something that's useful to their home, and if they think it's useful to their home and family life, they'll feel better about you. But also, they're going to bring good behavior back into the office, too. So you need to take advantage of these news events when something comes out. Like the latest LinkedIn, how many people saw the story like 170 million LinkedIn passwords up? And it's like, wait a second, that's from 2012. If you have the same LinkedIn password from 2012, you deserve to be hacked. That's pretty much a given. So anyway, especially after that hack was so widely publicized. So now let's start talking about the Syrian Electronic Army and integrating threat intelligence, and ideally you'll start to see how this all feeds together. So first there's, um, let's talk about the Syrian Electronic Army in general. Um, how many people remember, and it's kind of ironic, they just arrested one of the guys in the Syrian Electronic Army, they deported him from Germany, two of the other people are still inside Syria, I, thought, I honestly thought one of them was dead by now. 
But um, anyway, they arrested one of the people and stuff like that. But the Syrian electronic army actually was the news media darlings. And why? Because they hacked so many different things. And it's kind of fun. I mean, well, some of the hacks were kind of funny. I'll say it that way. But what they did was, and I'll talk about this. I'm trying to remember. But what they're famous for was they would try to fish companies, get credentials, and then change DNS service. So, for example, one of the ways they became famous was when they took down Twitter, the Huffington Post, and the New York Times website. What they did was, actually, I think I walked through that in another thing. But anyway, they target individuals within the organizations to try to access social media accounts. I'll start stepping through the examples. They focus on social media accounts, sometimes more than the organization itself. And we'll talk about how, why, because while the Syrian Electronic Army is being prosecuted primarily for extortion, because they went ahead and they became famous for quote unquote hacktivism. I hate that term. Most hacktivists are just hackers who want to feel better about themselves. So it's like, oh, I hack this, so stick a flag in it. Am I great and patriotic? It's like, you know, somebody wants, they hacked the law firm. And then they said, this law firm represented the cousin of one of the soldiers who was accused of war crimes then. So I hacked these people because they had some relation to something they have no relation to. So most hacktivists are really nothing more, and I mean even these people, most hacktivists are nothing more than hackers who would be hacking anyway who want to stick a flag in it. So I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. So let's talk about the New York Times hack, and I started stepping through it. So what happened was, they researched, they, well, they wanted to hack the New York Times website because obviously it gets a lot of attention. Now the thing is, they weren't really that good. They were not technically adept that the people would like to think they were, despite the fact they hacked all these websites. What they did was, they found out that the New York Times DNS domain service um, was managed by a company called Melbourne IT, which is actually an Australian web hosting company. And for whatever reason, Melbourne IT in Australia handled all of these things. So what they wanted to do was, they wanted to target Melbourne's IT customer service console where they can change DNS records and stuff like that. So they researched Melbourne IT, they probably tried phishing them and stuff and they were unsuccessful. However, they found out that Melbourne IT had a bunch of resellers around the world, so they targeted the, this New Zealand web host web services company that resold Melbourne IT services. So they went ahead and sent phishing messages to well to this New Zealand company. They hacked the credentials of these people and after they hacked the credentials of those people for this New Zealand company, they had access to the con customer control panel and they basically went ahead and was able to reassign the DNS server from the New York Times to a site that they controlled. It was bizarre. And then what happened was the New York Times kept going around trying to fix it. And the thing with DNS, if you understand DNS, you can change the DNS record, but if you don't change, it still takes 24 hours or more to get all the way around. So some people will look at it, look fixed. Other people will look at it, didn't look fixed. People didn't realize, because people at first thought they hacked the New York Times website. And they're trying to like, and then the admins were like, Nobody hacked our servers, our servers are fine. People are just not getting to it. They went to a different server somewhere else. But anyway, what happened was, if you think about it, they were trying to hack the New York Times. They couldn't hack the New York Times. They tried to hack their DNS provider, so they, they couldn't hack the DNS provider. So then they hacked somebody below them. And again, how they hacked them? They sent spear phishing messages. And they were able to do this. Now, the thing is that they went ahead and it wasn't just the New York Times, there's a few other ones uh, that I'm going to mention. But once they hacked the, the, it was the AP Twitter feed, Associated Press, and they actually caused a quarter trillion dollar loss on the stock market. Because they went ahead, hacked the AP Twitter feed, and reported an attack on the president. And that caused Wall Street to go into a tailspin because people assumed it was a real thing. Now here's the next thing, and you can't see this, but this was them trying to hack CNN. 
And so what they did was they targeted public individuals, like they targeted the reporters of CNN. And the reporters, if you know CNN well enough, you know that it's not CNN.com, it's Turner.com, because the reporters use Turner.com as their um, primary email address, it's not CNN. And they went ahead, they targeted, found through LinkedIn or just about anybody else. Then they sent email, they sent out phishing messages to the people, which basically asked them to reset their passwords. That's essentially what it was. The link, for many people, the link looked real. It just, you know, it, it looked real, and enough people changed their passwords so that they got access to the CNN Twitter feeds and everything else like that. More targeted. Sometimes it's apparently from company officials. So um, I'll tell you, well, without naming the people, there was a company I did work for, and this is how I became involved in a lot of this stuff. So there was a company that basically manages the online presences for the most major, a lot of the major companies out there. I can't tell you which ones, but they're like the major companies. And so they manage the online presences. And what happened was they went ahead and realized they needed access, and luckily they didn't get access to the customer accounts. But what they did was they sent a whole bunch of phishing messages or they sent a whole bunch of email messages that reportedly were from the CEO to the US employees that said, we're mentioned on CNN.com. Here's a link to the article on CNN.com. And they sent them the link and people would click on the link and say, oh, you have to log in to have access to it. And it asked them for their credentials to log in so they could access the message. And then they just stole the credentials and they were able to log on on these people and kind of try to go through their files and do a bunch of stuff. Ironically, one of the people they targeted was the CFO also. The CFO was a British guy. And what happened was, from the British guy, they didn't send him a message from the CEO. They sent him a message from the, one of their salespeople over in the UK and said, we're mentioned in the BBC. Look at this wonderful message from the BBC. And I was like, wow, that's kind of specific and stuff like that. Because the British guy was more likely to be involved and thrilled by the BBC than the CNN or whatever it was. So anyway, they looked at different geographic regions and targeted. It was kind of clever. Again, the attacks were not really that clever. They were just kind of a little bit thorough in how they were researched. So now here's the other thing. After additional success, see, and I'll say this publicly, because when you see there's a bunch of reporters who went ahead on behalf of the um, Syrian Electronic Army, and these reporters were literally the Syrian Electronic Army's bitches. There's no way around it. It's like, we're going to hack, get ready to write a story about this. And there's one reporter, you can follow the Twitter feeds, I don't remember his name, but he really deserves to be pulled out. Every time the Syrian Electronic Army was going to hack something, they let the guy know, You're gonna, we're going to hack something, be ready to write a story. And the reason they did that was they wanted the reporter to write a story really quickly and have a story out there, and then they would use that story for another round of phishing campaign. Kind of really, kind of on the clever side. Well, I shouldn't say clever. I hate to give criminals any due, but again, it's you know well researched. So anyway, they use those for other things. But once inside, another thing they try to do is send more phishing messages to people who didn't click. So if somebody, if they access somebody's accounts, the first thing they did was go through their email. They tried to look to see if they were on any internal emailing list. So that way, not only were they sending phishing messages from outside, now they were sending legitimate internal messages to people with phishing links. So there was a whole bunch of stuff like that. So they sent more phishing messages. They went to files. You know, if a company's on Google Apps, Google Apps was totally compromised for whatever the user had access to, so that was clearly a bad thing. And sometimes they change people to lock things out. Now, another thing they did was they let some accounts sit. So in other words, and this, and this is kind of where threat intelligence comes in, because now you're predicting what their actions are going to be. Because you could be like, well, these were the only people who were compromised, just make them change their passwords. It's like, you don't know. So you have to assume everybody's compromised. So they would sit on some accounts for another week, then they would log into those accounts and send out another batch of phishing messages and stuff to try to get more access after they were locked out of different accounts. So again, another well, look, password reuse on other accounts, because sometimes, and this happens a lot with the Syrian Electronic Army, 
uh, they go ahead and look for personal email addresses, and then they use the personal email addresses for social networking email addresses. It has been reported, because we're in LA, which is the heart of Sony Pictures now. I guess they're down the road from us, aren't they? Uh, so anybody here from Sony? I can make fun of them? Okay, good. So anyway, let's make fun of Sony. So what support supposedly happened with Sony Pictures was that once they sent phishing messages to them appearing to be from the app, Apple IDs, because if you have, for example, an iPhone, you're, you have to have an Apple ID, like, you know, at me.com, mac.com, or apple.com, or, well, it's usually me or mac.com or something like that. And so they sent phishing messages to people saying, you need to update your Apple ID, you know, what's your, log into your Apple ID, and then they capture the passwords, and then they reuse the Apple password on those people's business accounts, because they figured out who were the admins inside Sony, sent them phishing messages to, and hope that they reuse their, their passwords on the different accounts, and then they were able to get in that way. That's how it worked for Sony. That's how it worked for a lot of Syrian Electronic Army attacks as well. And then they reuse those accounts and change passwords and so on. Um, okay, so then what happened was I gave a presentation, and it's on YouTube if you ever want to look at it. Um, I gave a presentation calling the Syrian Electronic Army a bunch of names for being clueless, which they are, and calling them cockroaches, which they took offense to. I did not know that cockroach is a grave offense in the Arab world. So it's like I must have rubbed my foot on their mother's face the way they acted like it. So, um, which again is a grave offense in the Arab world too. That one I know though. But, um, so anyway, what happened was, I was actually, I think I told this story at a, this conference like two years ago or so, so some people might have heard this, but it gets better since then. But, uh, so what happened was, these people got together and they were offended by my presentation. So they wanted to hack RSA conference, like I really care if you hack RSA conference. And what they did was they researched the RSA conference website and figured out the RSA conference is running this software called, I don't know, it's like Agent Orange or something like that. I forgot the name of it. It's um, Orange something or other. So this Orange software, and what this software does is it tracks cursor movement to see what you're doing on the website to, so you can potentially optimize and see user behavior. And so what it does is when you log on, oh, Lucky Orange, so then when you log on to or go to the RSA conference website, it runs a JavaScript program automatically if you access JavaScript, and it makes a call from w1.livestockserver.com, which launches Lucky Orange. What happened, though, is this company, Lucky Orange, they have livestockserver.com as one of the domain addresses that they maintain. They have this company, Codero, who maintains their DNS. So the Syrian Electronic Army says, well, we can't do any good accessing Lucky Orange. Let's try to access Codero. So they went ahead, sent phishing messages to Codero, and they got some account executive to click on the phishing message and enter his credentials. This Codero company, once you logged on to their account, it was single sign-on. So they logged on to that person's um, Codero internal account. They accessed his email. It also allowed them to bring up the customer portals. So what he did was, and on a good note, Lucky Orange had LiveStatServer.com. It had the domain locked. However, it did not have the subdomain of W1 locked. So they, they changed the, the DNS address of W1.LiveStatServer.com. So instead of launching Lucky Orange when you went to the RSA conference website, it went ahead and went to an imgur.com address to just post this picture. And this is actually a picture. So if you go to RSA conference running JavaScript, you automatically got redirected to that. And then it turns out, much to my, I became famous. So it turns out that it wasn't just RSA conference running Lucky Orange. There were a few, like 10 or 20 other websites that were also running Lucky Orange. So even if you went to, I forgot, it was like some sort of scrapbooking site, you got that message from me. <laughs> it was kind of funny. So I had somebody who was not in the security profession, you know, it was one of my 3,000 bestest buddies in the whole wide world on Facebook. So yeah, I accept that with just about any request. So they went ahead and they said, Ira, do you know 
why are you on this thing? It's like my wife's scrapbooking page. And I'm like, I don't know. So then I figured out. So I found this out, and that's how they went ahead and did all that. So they sent a phishing message to Codero. So again, they researched former current employees, sent it to this uh, CEO, requested logon data, got credentials of the account executive, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, because they tried to go up the CEO, sent him a BBC News story about his company. Um, oh yeah, so then the Syrian Electronic Army still hates me. So, and what I did was, after they hacked the RSA conference site, you could go to securementum.com, and there's like how I detailed how they did this, basically saying, this was not the hack of the century like it was being portrayed, bless you. It was not the hack of the century like it was portrayed. I went step by step how kind of almost lame it was what they did. And I even highlighted the fact that they hacked the RSA conference website on a Friday night, not during a call for papers, not during a conference. I mean, if I hacked the RSA conference site, I had malicious intentions, I would sit on that site until there was a good watering hole attack, and then I could capture the security credentials of like half the security community. But no, these people blew their wad essentially on me to call me names. I contacted Brian Krebs. Brian Krebs is like, they went through all that trouble to call you a name? I'm like, yeah. He's like, this isn't even news for me. So, <laughs> but anyway, so after I called, I, sh I told the world how lame they were, then they went ahead and it wasn't good enough, so then they hacked the Wall Street Journal Twitter feeds. And they basically sent a bunch of phishing messages to reporters at the Wall Street Journal who had access, they got access to the tweet deck because the people were reusing their email <coughs> passwords as their tweet deck passwords at the Wall Street Journal. So then they created something called me a cockroach, like again, I care. I mean, that's my phone saver. My former business partner uses that still. So anyway. You so much better. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, that's um. Business card. Well, I, I was going to start doing that for my business card. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, people started thinking I was the Syrian Electronic Army. They're like, Iris, we realize they're trying to make you famous by this point. And so, and then it got even better. Oh yeah, the stupid thing was, one of the reporters from the Wall Street Journal actually retweeted that picture because he just retweeted everything the Wall Street Journal sent out. I'm like, what the, f oh, what the f? You know, it's like you're actually reading. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't read the message. It's like, good job, Brill. You know, Einstein. And anyway, so then they were still mad because what happened was when the Wall Street Journal was hacked, you know, CNN wanted to cover that, right? So CNN covered the Wall Street Journal hack, calling me the go-to guy for the Syrian Electronic Army, and there was an article. In, the, in CNN.com, where again, I called the Syrian Electronic Army a bunch of losers to, some, to that effect. So they got mad again. And then they hacked BuzzFeed's Twitter accounts to millions of people and followers. So anyway, they went ahead, they sent lots of phishing messages through YouTube or whatever. They did compromise one person, because they actually spoke, I mean, these people gave me great access to everyone. Anyway, they compromised people on tweet. They then they compromised the tweet deck account, and there was password reuse on tweet deck, so they were able to send it down. And they sent it out through BuzzFeed UK thing and a couple other BuzzFeed feed. And literally, so now the joke was, and now I, this is literally the quote from the editor in chief of BuzzFeed. He's like, Ira, and I'm like, if you're if you're offended by cursing, you shouldn't be in my presentation anyway. But either way, his exact quote was, he's like, no offense, but. I've never heard of you, and who the fuck are you that they're hacking my site because of you? And I'm like, I don't know, they need a life. So anyway, that's BuzzFeed. So then they wanted to go ahead, because you know I couldn't let this lie. So I was, yeah, I mean again, people were swearing I was the Syrian Electronic Army because I was getting all this press from them. So then what happened was, there I was, and I wrote an article on Computer World basically saying that the Syrian Electronic Army has, quote unquote, for lack of a better term, jumped the shark. Because think about it this way, they're out there supposed to be helping the Syrian government in one level and all this stuff. And here they are, they're getting in a flame war with me. And it's like, where's, there's no clue to these people. So I wrote an article basically detailing what they did. 
Of course, by this point, the FBI wanted to talk to me because they're like baffled by the whole event. So I was talking to people in the FBI, and then, you know, the FBI was saying, it's like, Ira, when you write this article in Computer World, basically throwing more, you know, more fuel on the fire, they're going to try to hack Computer World. Again, threat intelligence. We know their mode of operation, right? So there they are trying to, so we're like, well, what are we going to do? So we went ahead, and they basically, we created an awareness campaign specifically for the Syrian Electronic Army. We told people, because Computer World is part of the IDG universe, you know, IDG is a media network, it has Computer World, Network World, PC World, Mac World, World World, CSO, CIO, whatever. So we're like, they're going to try to hack you. And, then I, and there was like serious discussion inside of IDG, do we want to publish this story? You know, it's like, you know, because we're going to be hacked. So what happened was we went ahead proactively and said, okay, we believe you're going to be hacked. So they're like, let's do it. What should we do? So we went ahead and we created an awareness program, very specific, and said, odds are pretty good. This article is going to come out within, depending upon what time it is in Syria or elsewhere, a few, you know, there will be an attack within a few hours of that. Look for, look for any message which indicates that they want you to go to another site to read an article about the company or whatever else. Do not click on a link, do not enter your credentials and so on. Very specific guidance on what to expect, what will the messages be, what are the red flags in this case, and then what to do. And then most important, report this as quickly as possible. So anyway, the article went live. Within four hours, they started to send phishing messages. And then the attack, as expected, there was an article linked from, and this was the best part to tell you how clueless these people were. They actually sent the message from somebody who left the company two months ago, and they didn't know that. So it was like, you know, some executive editor left IDG two months prior, and the message came from him. And everybody's like, he left the company. <laughs> so that's how bad it was. Um, then the employees, were when they got it, people started sending the messages in. Like Computer World was on the, it's like, Ira, we started getting the messages. I'm like, good. And then people would log on, and people would say, oh, you know, it's like, you know, enter your user ID, byteatme.com, um, enter your password, Assad sucks, you know, things like that. So, and remember that, because the Syrian Electronic Army actually said they did collect some credentials but chose not to exploit them. Like, byteatme.com is not real, okay? So anyway, but what happened was when the warnings came in, they started to go through the emails and said, we're going through the servers and we're going to start to delete the messages that haven't been opened yet. Because it's possible that just because people started reporting, it doesn't mean everybody was as aware of the people reporting it. Also, what they did was they blocked the fake domain that the logon screen would go to because they hacked some domain in like a UK company or something like that. So it's like, you know, some company, you know, .uk slash like stupid log on type of thing, that, that PHP or whatever. So anyway, they went to there and they blocked that domain so people couldn't go to that domain even if they did open it up. So again, there was a two-pronged attack. Telling people not to do it, having them report it, once they reported it, it fed back into the cycle and started having people delete messages and block domains. So even if people were not as aware, everything started getting um, done. So then, they were kind of frustrated. And it was really, it gets even more pathetic for the Syrian Electronic Army. So what they did was, they started calling people up. And they called up Ellen Mesmer, who's one of the senior editors at Network World Magazine. And they're like, um, we're with your company, we need your password. And it's like, what company? Your company. And it's like, uh, I don't, you know, what's your name? And they hung up. Then they called her back, and they go, we're with your company. We need your password. And it was a different voice this time. And it's like, and they're like, well, what company again? Oh, oh no, we're, we're with Windows. And then she's like, 
Windows is a product, it's not a company. Oh, we're with Microsoft, and then they hung up on her. This is how, you know, then they try to claim, like CSO Magazine did a story. It was their B team. There's only three people, we know they didn't have a B team. So anyway, um, that's pretty much what they had to resort to. They got so frustrated, that's how bad they were. Now, the unusual. The FBI guy was sitting there, we were having lunch. He's like, I don't know how, but I don't know why or how, but they literally hate you more than they hate President Obama. <laughs> I'm like, I'm kind of proud of that one. <laughs> so anyway, they took that. They took exception to me naming some people there and stuff like that. You know, that did some support for them. They took exception to being called a cockroach. I'm like, that's the least of the things I've called them. They shouldn't. Um, you know, they have the tactics of script kitties. And they waste an incredible watering hole opportunity for RSA. Again, there's so much better they could have done than call me names at RSA. I mean, that's the one that's baffling. So their true personality, and this is where it becomes important, they're clearly driven by ego more than their principles. I was calling them lamers and cockroaches and stuff. And despite the fact that their principles were, let's forward the goals of Assad, they would hack major news sites to call me a name Instead of like saying, you know, this. I mean, it's like when they had BuzzFeed, it was like, Ira Winkler's a cockroach. And then it's like, oh, by the way, don't insult Syria anymore. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, I guess their handlers were like, what are you doing? So anyway, they finally got back. Demonstrates limited capability, but the pull out all stops. Script kitty mentality because someone called them names is a burn. They had this little hacker mentality from the 90s. You know, you can do whatever, but don't call me a lamer. Anyway, I'm elite, spell 3433, whatever it is, I don't know. I'm not elite enough to know how to spell elite in misspelling words. So anyway, like we start talking about threat intelligence. Methods beginning to be used by other criminals. The Syrian Electronic Army, for all their faults, China and other, because the FBI told me, we're concerned about some of these things because China and other places are starting to use similar tactics. They're actually out there attempting to start like researching people, they're using news articles, they're working with reporters to try to get people follow-up stories, they're sitting dormant, you know, they have some tactics that people are starting to use. And again, 91% of all spear phishing messages are starting to resolve. Now here's the thing, the other people, not the Syrian Electronic Army, because the Syrian Electronic Army could have, they've done extortion attempts, like distributed denial, denial of service attacks and stuff, but they could have done so much more damage to all these companies that they were doing, but instead they really just wanted to call me names. Um, let's see, so here's the thing. Do you want to take a break? We're about a little more than halfway through. Do you want a break or you want to keep going? Okay, keep going. Okay, now we're switching kind of the threat intelligence, and as you started seeing the semi electronic army thing, started showing you how we can start bringing threat intelligence and security awareness together. Now, there's the Bruce Lee quote. I already likes Bruce Lee quotes and stuff like that. And here's the thing. Like I told you, the Syrian Electronic Army is a bunch of fools. But a wise man can learn more from a fool than a fool can learn from a wise man. Watching users do stupid things. Now, I don't want to call them fools. Again, if you, don't, if you think that the users are, the stu are stupid, you're the stupid one. But either way, watching people do things and watching them do things unwisely tells you how to improve yourself. If you start looking for why are they doing it in the ways they're doing. How can you use this for your betterment and stuff like that? Now, think of it this way. Hacking BuzzFeed Twitter, you know, hacking Twitter feeds, not the greatest thing in the world. Hacking RSA conference, you know something? If any other hacker would have hacked RSA conference site, that would be a quote unquote epic hack. We were talking about, you know, at lunchtime we were talking about like how EC Council was hacked serving malware. You know something? Brilliant hack. You know, I don't blame people for being hacked because eventually there's too many vulnerabilities to have. Again, perfect security, I told you, anybody who promises perfect security is either a fool or a liar. So there's never going to be perfect security. I don't blame, in theory, EC Council for being hacked. Maybe the response could have been improved or whatever. Likewise, I don't express RSA for being hacked, but RSA conference has probably been probed for millions of times, literally millions of times, and has not been hacked to that extent previously. So these guys did do 
a relatively incredible feat by some amateurist tactics at the end of the day. And the defenders learn about many of the vulnerabilities. See, here's the thing. RSA Conference, Lucky Orange, and all these other people, me, we were sitting there, wow, that was an interesting tactic. I learned better how they attack things, so when I get called again for Syrian Electronic Army attacks, I'm learning from them. What did the Syrian Electronic Army learn? It's like, don't get into a pissing contest with Ira at the end of the day, because he's just going to call me more names because he doesn't care if he put, a head of a, if he put his face on a cockroach. It's like, hell, he, he shows it at conferences. He reposted himself. Anyway, but the problem is, though, in threat intelligence, you know, it's like the emperor's new clothes. People are misusing and abusing the term most of the time. People are going out there buying data that they don't know how to use, they don't know how to apply, because information, you can buy things, it's like having a firewall, and this is true, I once like, was doing a firewall assessment, and I asked the guy, I asked the admin, I'm like, I need to see your rule set so I can see what you're doing, and he sent me back this form. I go, I could be, you might not have understood the form, but you're basically saying you allow all protocols out and all protocols in. And he's like, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's the policy. I go, why is that the policy, just out of curiosity? And he's like, well, we started having it like as restrictive as possible, and then we had, and then what happened was, we got a call from the CEO that he wanted to access his Facebook account from his desktop, and then, you know, we just fell out, let's stop getting complaints, and we turned everything on, and now we haven't got any more complaints. I'm like, can't argue with that logic to a certain extent. But the problem is, it's like, what's really going on? Intelligence is grossly misused these days. Everybody likes to call things threat intelligence, threat intelligence. You know, and here's the thing that a lot of people do. And, and this is one of the problems. Organizations that are using intelligence properly, they understand there's no such thing as a good single source of intelligence. So when you're sitting down with a vendor of threat intelligence, and they're trying to sell you on one over the other, and they're like, well, we have this, we have that. The banks and other people who use threat intelligence well, they want to get a subscription to just about every threat intelligence feed they can find. And the reason is that they provide different types of data. Everybody has their own little... I'm from Maryland, and the one thing that drives me crazy is everybody tries to sell, we have the best Maryland crab cakes. And it's like, you know, some of them are good, some of them outright suck, but they're all a little bit different. And, you know, you want to get the good ones without the sucky ones, and, you know, you want to go out. But the thing is, intelligence can't be bought at the end of the day. Because people are saying, buy intelligence. You can't buy intelligence. Really, you can just get the data for the intelligence for your own organizations. Now let's talk about the SCA. I started going ahead a little bit about that. I guess it's good Ari's not here because she'd be complaining that I took her slide over already. But so what happened with this is Syrian Electronic Army attack was thwarted because of threat intelligence. When the Syrian Electronic Army tried to go after Computer World, they failed miserably because we knew exactly what their tactics were, we knew exactly how they would be coming for it, we knew exactly the form, we knew exactly what they were going to go for. So we knew in advance, step by step, what they were going to do, and we knew how they were going to do it so we would take proactive measures. Because again, there wouldn't have been perfect security. We assumed that while 99 out of 100 people might have detected that as a phishing message, if one person clicked on it, it could destroy the image of the organization. So we assumed something might get through, so we had steps in place to say, make sure they report it so that we can try to stop it before other people who are less aware click on the messages. So anyway, that was the thing. Incident response attacks are being presented by good. Incident response leverages consumption, contribution to, and the order. That's clearly an Ari sentence. I have like the great, you know, the, the, the diction of a third grader. She actually tries to put intelligence behind her thoughts. Anyway, so threat intelligence goes beyond people, but it integrates into ongoing technical attacks as well. Because when they're coming at you, it's not just they're going to try this tactic and that user. If you have good threat intelligence, you know the type of technology they're going to use, you know their preferred styles, you know a whole bunch of different things. So for example, if you have a good threat intelligence, a good security program, 
and you can identify the hacker types who are coming after you, it's sort of like everybody likes to blame China. And frankly, there's a little bit of, if you have a good program, if you have a bad program, it doesn't matter whether you're hacked by China, Russia, or whoever. But if you know you're going to be hacked, if you're being hacked by China versus being hacked by Russia, it actually does matter. Because this way you know how to better respond. You know the types of tools they're going to use. You know the types of other areas of going to. You know their priorities once they get in. One organization might go to the communication servers while other communication, while the other organization might go to the storage servers. So you have to know their tactics as best as possible so you can plan what their actions are if you feel that you're under attack by these people. So again, I'll use the example. If you're using more of a military thing, if you know you're being attacked by, let's, if you know ISIS is coming at you like in a, like a fight in, the, in Afghanistan, oh, sorry, not in Afghanistan, in like Iraq, it's like, what are they going to use? ISIS is going to use small arms fire, they're going to use trucks. They might try to use like um, caterpillar types of big trucks, like earth mover types of things, if they could get access to that. But they're not coming after you with tanks. They're not coming after you with aircraft. You know the type of attack they're going to do. On the other hand, if we're in like the South China Sea and we're dealing with China, militarily, they're going to have advanced avionics. They're going to have radar jammers. They're going to have a whole bunch of stuff. With ISIS, maybe they'll have like a drone they bought off of Amazon or something. But you've got to know, because that way you know the type of security measures you need, the type of protocols, because if you know now ISIS is getting, now this is actually a true thing, you know ISIS is getting more desperate, so now ISIS is res resorting much more to suicide-based attacks where they're not just going to have cars come at you like bring in soldiers and try to get in skirmishes. They actually might have those cars filled with explosives because they're losing, and they're going to go ahead and try to have suicide bombers now more frequently in little skirmishes. So that's important to know how the tactics are evolving and changing. There's a big difference, and this is where most intelligence programs fail. Because much like I told you, most awareness programs aren't awareness programs, much intelligence programs aren't intelligence programs. They're information programs. Because what's information? Information, and this goes back to my, um, the next two slides I'm probably going to end up combining into one right now. Information is basically, well actually, let's take a step back to my NSA days. I was an intelligence analyst at NSA for a while. And one thing you learned is the difference between data, information, and intelligence. Data is basically random fact bits. You know, here is a, you know, so in the computer world, a random fact is we have a ping from this address. We have something at that address. We have this. That's a fact. Information is, okay, we have these little bits of data, now let's organize them. This ping is coming from that, that place and that so on. This ping is coming from here, there's several pings, so we're compiling information. So information is organized data. Now we have information. What's intelligence though? Intelligence is organized information. You're taking a lot of different sources. You're saying, okay, I have, this, I have these little facts which combine into a big fact. What do these big facts mean to me? What does it mean that I now have like attacks, I, or I shouldn't say attacks, but I have a lot of warnings coming in from these, um, from these triggers. I have my servers essentially being targeted. What does that mean? Well, if your servers are being targeted, what's the protocols? What type of tools are there being used there? That's intelligence data. Because what happens is different attackers have different preferred tools, techniques, and protocols. So you have to go ahead and understand what type of tools, techniques, and protocols are being used so that you can define information and figure out how to take action. That's what intelligence is. It should be actionable information. So to a large extent, this is kind of what we're, you know, this slide here, this is much more factual based on like, again, information is raw and mitigated data, intelligence is normalized, parsed, processed to being useful and digestible. Because again, you're going from lots and lots of stuff. So for example, in the intelligence world, let's just say we have overhead satellites that take pictures of every square inch of the desert. That's raw data. Then you have information, which if you use that, it's like, wait a second, there's a bunch of buildings here in the middle of nowhere. What are these buildings here in the middle of nowhere? Then you have, okay, intelligence is, that bunch of buildings in the middle of nowhere is a poppy field. 
Okay, that poppy field is being used by terrorists to create poppy to fund their terrorist operations, which is a true thing. Or you could say there's a bunch of buildings there. Wait a second, that's a terrorist training camp in the middle of nowhere, so that's a valid military target. So that's an example of going from data to information to actionable intelligence. So I covered a lot of this, but essentially intelligence is basically organized action information, and information quantifies the decisions, intelligence qualifies the decisions. So in other words, information, I, I'm, this obviously is our slide, information tells you, okay, how big is the potential problem? Now if we know how big the potential problem is, the question is how serious it is. What is the damage that's caused by the problem? What is the cost of mitigating the problem and so on? So it's much more refined. Again, intelligence pro provides refinement. There's also motive versus method, and there's a difference. So, for example, when you look at the Syrian Electronic Army attacks and attacking the RSA conference, the methods that are, they used, could the methods used by the Syrian Electronic Army have been used to compromise the whole security community? Yes. They could have gone out and collected user IDs and passwords for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of security professionals if they did it smartly. That's the method. On the other hand, what was the motive? The motive was to call either a name. Why does that matter? The, yeah, the motive matters because it tells you how much resources to put into the response. The motive tells you how serious the potential damage is. The motivation tells you how to respond. So if you know that their intent was to call our names, that's one thing. If you, however, know that somebody's breaking into a bank for the purpose of stealing, of stealing money, that's one thing. However, here's another case. If China's breaking into a bank, and I'm using China as an example in this case, if China's breaking into a bank, China might not break into the bank to steal money. China might break into a bank to see how much money different people have for purposes of espionage, for purposes of recruiting people as spies. It might also go ahead and like the OPM hack, if China hacked the OPM like they think, that can tell you who they work for. So if they're actually working undercover, which unfortunately the OPM database would have information to figure out that sort of stuff, that tells you I've got a whole bigger problem. Because if they were just in there to steal money and do identity theft, that would have been great. But if they're there to say, I want to know every undercover intelligence operative operating around the world, you know something? They gave them identity theft protection. They gave them life lock for a year. Big deal. It's the most useless thing ever because China's not going to go ahead and try to screw the people. China's going to go ahead and wait till they're stationed overseas, knock on their door and say, hey, you know what? I know you're a spy. I know you're eighty thousand dollars in debt. How would you like to at least get fifty thousand in debt or something like that? And by the way, we know something about your cousin, your family, your sexual perversions, and all that sort of stuff. So again, big thing: known attackers equals known methods, and it knows where to look. So again, if you know the methods, you know what other potential damage was done, like I mentioned. Also, motives can imply what type of things that they might try, what they're looking for, and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, making intelligence actionable. Um, if you can figure out, based upon the intelligence, what are the methods, you know what to look for. So if you know intelligence about the people, you know intelligence about the attacks you're seeing, you can go ahead and start to investigate incidents better. You can start to potentially mitigate follow-up incidents. So like I said, the Syrian Electronic Army, they will sit dormant on some compromised accounts. And why is that important? Because some people say, oh, my account wasn't compromised. It's like, well, you know what? We're resetting everybody's passwords and everybody has to change the password, period. So you go ahead and you force password resets for everybody in the organization. Even though it's inconvenient, it might take time, might take calls to help desk, you know you're going to do that. So anyway, it looks at the likely targets, it helps to identify the types of technical attacks, it tells you, for example, if these people, you know that they're likely to go ahead and potentially root Unix-based systems and put backdoors in Unix-based systems, but they might not touch the Windows systems. You know kind of where to look, what to look for, the types of attacks, 
Again, you know, the type of action to take after the thing, because again, if you know the tactics and targets and methods and everything like that, you can go ahead and start writing rules. You can start blocking people out, for example, like if you know like they're going back and forth to different websites, you can start blocking different websites, block different domains. You can start knowing, for example, if you have an advanced persistent threat, what they like to do is, um, this is a good example for China. For and now, well, China is a great one. Actually, credit card thieves like the Target hacker did the same type of thing. What they did was they set up a staging server inside your organization, and they set up the staging server and sent all data to that server. Because what will happen if you start seeing lots of data go to these websites? It's more likely to get picked up. So what they do is they send data to another compromised server keep all the data aggregated, and then at one point in time, they just blast it out through a video port. You know, they make it look like it's a video stream so that you're less likely to detect it. But if you go ahead and you know the methods that an, an ongoing attack is using, you know to start looking for the staging or exfiltration server, as it's called, and then you start knowing, wait a second, I gotta look for mass data movement and block video feeds. I gotta look in audits and archives for what type of video feeds have left my company and stuff like that. Because again, you can compile all this intelligence, but if it's not actionable, it's gonna be useless and you're wasting money. Because otherwise you're going to report, it's like, well we investigated these people, we know the next thing they're gonna try to do is this. It's like, are you gonna try to stop them? Well, no, no, we don't have the money for that, but it's nice to know. <laughs> Which is actually a conversation that goes on in most organizations. And then the next conversation is, well, what happens if they do everything you're going to say? It's like, well, it's China. They're going to steal the stuff, and then they're just going to like use our plans and then market the same products in China and stuff like that. They're like, well, will anybody be able to trace it back to us? And it's like, well, not really, so uh, well, I'll let it go. So, and that literally happens in some cases. So anyway, the intelligence life cycle, you've got to know your data sources, the organized information. Actually, let me go to the next slide quickly and start discussing that. But again, uh, so data, again, you're collecting data points from different intelligence sources, which is critical for most things. You've got to start everything off with data. That's a fact of life. Then once you have that, you start developing your processes, your sources. You've got to start figuring out how to now analyze it. So again, figure out what your data feeds are potentially, then you've got to figure out how do you use those data feeds to create intelligence. Then once you have that, you've got to have a process. What, let's say intelligence tells you we have bad guys who are going to potentially do this to us. What is your response plan? Are you start having incident response plans? Are you going to start like, what's the media? You've got to figure out if you have the intelligence plan proactively for creating the action. So you've got to figure out what are the actions, because without planning that, you're wasting your money again. Then once you're in action, once you start having some information, you've got to start engaging, you've got to start implementing, coordinate the actions, you've got to start knowing all of this proactively, and it feeds back into it. Then once you have that, you can measure, have your actions been effective? If they have been effective, it's like, okay, great. But even if they have been effective, how can you fine tune it? How can you improve the processes? How can you improve your intelligence? Like, for example, going back and saying, wait a second, I have all this, I have information, for example, that these people are compromising my servers, I have the information that they're exfiltrating the data, but I gotta say, what else are they doing? Because I'm only seeing this part of it. Now, what am I learning? And I'm like, wait a second, I'm possibly missing a whole detection capability. So now I have to go back and feed it because here's what a lot of people don't know about detection and if you're doing threat intelligence, the best detection capabilities are where you can see both inbound and outbound stuff. A lot of detection and intelligence is based just on one way of communication. So for example, if you see somebody attacking you from a point, that's good to know. But if somebody's attacking, great. Sometimes you see intelligence capabilities that say there's data trying to go out. And that's also okay. You know, that's important. But the most useful data is when you can see two-way interaction. I see something attempting to go in. I see something attempting to go out. What's the difference? That way you have the most control. You see what the cause and what the effect is. And sometimes, just to let you know, there's a whole philosophy and this is for a different presentation, 
But I remember the days early on when we were implementing network architectures and we would put the IPS, intrusion prevention system, outside the firewall. Everybody's like, that's kind of stupid. And it's like, you know, do you want to put it inside the firewall? Because you only care what got through so you could try to prevent it. It's like, well, no, I need to see if my firewall is good enough. Because if I start seeing that their tactics are going to be changing, that they're trying me and they're trying something and they're not getting in, or they're trying something that indicates they have more information about my insides. Because if you see them come in, and they're trying to attack a specific server inside your organization, but they can't get through, you need to know, it's like, wait a second, I better start looking on that server, because they're coming after something I wasn't previously looking at. So again, that's the type of intelligence you need to know, you need to look for, and so on, to modify things. So again, the more you have, the better. Again, re-entry, you feed it, you make it consumable and stuff like that. Ari has a bunch of funny words I don't like. But anyway, basically what the implication of re-entry is, is that it goes ahead and it starts feeding back into itself. And then once you have it feeding back into itself, you can start modifying, increasing your data sources, improving your analysis capability, and so on. Anyway, institutional intelligence. Here's the thing that most people want. The whole focus for most in truth intelligence, threat intelligence companies is buy my product, buy my service, so we can give you information about what's out there. Frankly, nine, well, I shouldn't give you a number, but let's just say a very, very, very significant part of your threat intelligence, it's not what's out there, it's what's inside your own organization. That's where threat intelligence is the most valuable. You've got to start looking around. How are my systems communicating with each other? What type of protocols are being run? What type of other information is out there? Because you need to know more about your own behavior than the bad guy's behavior. Because you need to know how you respond to organizations. You need to know how you're going to react and so on. So again, you've got to understand, you are your most valuable source of intelligence data, no matter how many feeds this, other companies tell you they have on the dark web or whatever. Your own company, unfortunately, is the most devastating dark web most organizations have. So you've got to worry about that part of it. Um, also, here's a big thing that most people don't like. Ari and I gave a presentation at RSA this year, and we actually had some mixed reviews. It's kind of like a lot of people said it was great, people came over to us, because one of the points we made was assume failure. Your programs are going to fail. Failure is good. And people are saying, nobody ever told me we're allowed to fail before. I'm like, no, you're expected to fail. And this is not in the presentation itself, but here's a critical part. Nobody tells you in security. I learned this because I did studies of defensive information warfare for the Pentagon. But here's the thing. Most people do not have security programs. They don't. They have protection programs. Really what a good security program is, it's detection, Oh, sorry, protection, detection, and reaction. If you don't have all three, you do not have a security program. Most organizations just have a flat out protection program that doesn't have sufficient <coughs> detection and doesn't have sufficient reaction. And the reaction helps you improve your protection once you see what's out there. So you gotta go ahead and understand your security protections are gonna fail. And here's the good part. Just because your protections fail, it doesn't mean your security program fails. Because if somebody gets in, if they can't get out, it doesn't matter. Because you don't care if somebody breaks into your system, you care what they do once they break in. So if somebody's in there trying to steal credit cards, but you stop them before they get the credit cards out, you technically really don't have an incident. You have somebody tried to, they might have accessed it, but you implemented protections quickly and you block them from getting out. That's important. So again, assume failure. Assume you're doing it. And this is where the concept comes up. You've got to understand the concept of threat hunting. Assume you're doing, assume you have failed. Now there's different definitions of threat hunting. And even like I was like, I love his name. Uh, Stephen Northcutt for SANS, he like wrote a paper on threat hunting and everything. I go, what's your definition of threat hunting? He's like, good question, let me check. And this is like, you know, and it wasn't meant as being a facetious or a sarcastic comment. It's meant that there's a lot of potential definitions of threat hunting. But in a good organization, what you're doing is, you're assuming your organization has failed. 
you assume that some part of your organization says, I don't see a problem, but you know, the only people that think they haven't been hacked are fools or liars again. So you've got to go in and say, hey, if I was hacked, where would I look? If I was a bad guy, what would I look for? What would I do? And then you take a step back. It's like, wait a second, I look for the data. I look at my credit card service. And you're like, well, am I seeing anything come out of it? And start assuming there's some level of failure. So that way, and even if you have an attacker, start thinking the attacker, start thinking, what has the attacker done to get where they are? What would they have done if they were successful? How did they become successful? So you can feed back into your intelligence process, your awareness program. So you know, the best example is like the Syrian Electronic Army. Why were they successful? Well, they were successful because of phishing incidents. Now, one of the things I learned when we were doing like the awareness program, like after the fact, after the Syrian Electronic Army got in, I was interviewing people. I'm like, look, you know, you know, you had the training, and I'm assuming you know you know, to hover over a phishing message to say the link doesn't go where it is. It's like, isn't it obvious? It's like, yeah, we were trained that when we're on a desktop computer, you know, you hover over the link and it says the link doesn't go. And frankly, our PCs have web browsers that stop us. If, it, if the link is not a good link, it flags it. I go, so how come you clicked on it? It's like, well, I woke up in the morning, I checked my email on my cell phone, and I opened up the link. I'm like, did anybody ever train you how to detect a phishing message on a mobile device? They're like, no. I'm like, oh, well, there's a problem that we can address. We need to implement awareness training on how to detect phishing messages on mobile devices, which is very unique. Because, I mean, I don't, and here's the sad part. I did not learn this until after I was investigating the incident. If you have an iPhone, do you know how to tell where the link goes? I pop quiz. A lot of you are saying no. You've got, to stick your hand. You've got to hold your finger on the thing, and then it'll say, you know, oh, you know, show address link or something like that. And you're a security professional if you don't know that. And that's the problem. So a lot of people don't know that awareness implementation, so people are sending out all these phishing simulations that are great for looking at the computers on their desktops, but they're completely ignoring the differences on looking at mobile devices, where most people are going to check their stuff, especially when they're an executive waking up on a Friday morning. So you got to worry about that. So anyway, also, don't, um, don't look at your place in the kill chain versus the food chain. This is a Ariism, and you got to understand where she's coming from on this. Because the kill chain says, and I gave a different presentation in RSA a couple years ago, on um, what is the fishing kill chain? A kill chain implies there are several different places along the way to stop an attack in progress. And you could say, I want to stop the attack as quickly as I can. And it's like, maybe you don't. If you're like, why? It's like, you want to let the bad guys go. And here's what I'll tell you. So let's say you know, what's a good example? Um, no, this isn't the greatest one. But let's say you know Russia wants to attack France and Italy and the Mediterranean. And they're going to send a whole bunch of warships down. It's like, well, let's go bomb those warships and everything. It's like, well, no, why don't we wait till they try to go through the Straits of Gibraltar while we can put cannons on both sides and just bombard them if they try to get them in. The they're like, oh, that's a good idea. Because that's where you have it. The kill chain, you can stop them anywhere getting into the place. You can send bombers out. But the best is like, let's just focus all our resources to make sure nobody gets in. And then if anybody gets in, then we can send out a few bombers because it's much more controllable this way. So you've got to understand, the kill chain is what are the all potential steps. The food chain is what's the easiest steps to stop the bad guy. And your threat intelligence program is going to tell you both. If you know the attacker, you know their methods, and you know how to stop them, or you know potential places to stop them, and then you can decide where is the most effective place to stop them. Much like we said, we know the Syrian Electronic Army is going to come to us. We don't know which address they're going to come from, but we do know that we can stop them from getting out if we delete all the messages off the system as quickly as we can, and then we try to block the web domains as best we can. So again, figure out that information, and then you identify where you should block yourself. Um, going back, I kind of blocked this. So going back into this, you know, using threat intelligence, in the first place, what does threat intelligence say if you're going to be a target by the Syrian Electronic Army? You've got to go ahead and you've got to lock all the domains down. 
In other words, you know you got to do, you know, like the livestatserver.com address. Yeah, the one of the ways that the attack was almost prevented was livestatserver.com was, you know, blocked. So that's number one. Dual factor authentication. This isn't just for the Serial Electronic Army. This is by default. Most of the companies we work with have Google Apps. A lot of companies have, like, the, using their Twitter feeds were hacked with the Serial Electronic Army. All of these people allow dual factor authentication by sending, like, a, a text to a phone. If any of these organizations would have had dual factor authentication on their accounts, it would have been non-issues. The attack would have been stopped right away. So again, if you know you're potentially the target of similar electronic army, or frankly, anybody in the world, dual factor authentication is the highest return on investment you can ever have. You know, use the, you know, ensure hardware function is possibly enabled, got wrong links, blah, blah, blah. Proper awareness training, warning against mobile logins and stuff like that, like I already mentioned before. Putting it together. Threat intelligence makes your imminent threats real. If you know who's potentially going to be attacking you, or if you know they are attacking you, the more you know about them, the more effective you can stop them in action. Again, you can use a potential threat, make awareness materials like we did. We went ahead and we said, we're probably going to be hacked through these methods by these people. Please go ahead and take action. Here's specifically what to look for. More action will be hard, you know, more, more likely actions will be heard and acted upon. Because here's the good thing. Remember how I said motivation is the most critical part of any awareness program? Because you could tell people bad guys are going to do things in order to stop the bad guys, you need to do this. They need the motivation. Honestly, the most aware people in the world at the time was the IDG company when we were telling them that, hey, we can pretty much guarantee with certainty the Syrian Electronic Army is going to come after us because of this article. And you've been reading articles about them and writing articles about them for years. Now they're going to come after us. That made it real. That made it motivating to the people. So again, it puts having actionable intelligence. And like I said, also, don't discount like all those new, like the logins, like a quarter billion logins being account, hacked and stuff like that. Tell people that. It, makes, it puts them at the top of their mind knowing they're a victim. If they have LinkedIn, they could very likely be a victim. Make it real to them. Using home security concerns, again, telling people this works in the office but it also works at home is going to be valuable for people too. So look at that. Um, mentioned feeding back into the cycle. With threat intelligence, what we're saying is the more users are aware, the more they provide you information. But again, one of the reasons that IDG was successful against the Syrian Electronic Army attacks was probably not because everybody got the message, but because enough people got the message that the messages were deleted as quickly as possible and domains were blocked so nobody could go ahead and make the mistake to fall for the phishing messages. Incident reports, again, start feeding back in, indicates you're looking for other attack vectors. So again, it's great. Once you know that they're attacking you one way, they could attack you another. The fact the Syrian Electronic Army had a resort to using social engineering telephone calls, people were already on the alert for that. That is some stupid person in a foreign accent saying, I'm with Windows, I need your login. It's going to, I mean, frankly, that should trigger most people. But, you know, the fact it's on top of people's mind meant not only did they get that stupid call, it meant they knew to report it immediately as well. And then once those telephone calls came in, everybody was warned, be, be alert for potential calls from service providers like Windows or Microsoft. And everybody's like, Windows? Are you out of your mind? But anyway, so look for that. And, and in the case, other users might have fell victim. Because here's another thing that happens. If somebody goes ahead and reports the phishing message, because another thing that did happen out of there, they did say the, the attack is we warned you about is coming in. Here's what the message looks like. Please don't click on it. However, if you have clicked on it, please let us know now. Because we know people could have fell for it. It's not unheard of. So if you tell people, here's what happened, let us know now and you're not going to be in trouble, you're more likely to stop it because if one person did get in, it's much more likely to be a problem for people. So you've got to worry about that. So again, it allows you to say, we're under attack. Please let us know if you fell victim. That's okay. 
Awareness leads to more awareness, like I mentioned before. Intelligence leads to more motivations, tells people what to look for, and so on. Ari, Ari is a big, uh, well, not believer, Ari is a big advocate, that's the best word, on integrate past failures and success into your instant response programs. When you see where your programs were successful, where your programs failed, you know better how to pro improve your programs proactively. Because you're not failing if you're, well, I hate that term. It sounds like, you know, Anthony Robbins should be saying this. You're not failing if you're learning. Yes, you might have failed, but at least if you learn, you will fail less in the future, and that's a good thing. You know, make rules and be willing to break them by assuming failure. You know, you have to go ahead and assume people are doing things right, but when they do things wrong and things fail, find out why they failed. And don't be afraid to say we made a mistake by telling you this because we should have done something else. So again, accept you can't measure things, be willing to acknowledge, share private information, and feed the machine. Uh, my stuff is, look at awareness as more than throwing computer-based training and phishing at people. Like I mentioned, too many people are out there saying, our organization has 100% participation in watching the video. It's like your organization has 100% success in wasting time. I'm not a great advocate because, think of it this way, and I, here's how I look at mandatory CBT training. Do I think CBT training should be considered as part of an awareness program? Yes. But stop and think about, if you're, a, if you're a large organization, like, and there are a few organizations with more than 100,000 people, you have 100,000 people out there. The awareness program, let's say, is between three and 10 minutes, you know, like a monthly video is between three and 10 minutes on average. Let's say it's 10 minutes if you include the time they have to open up the email, the time they have to watch it and check the questions and stuff like that. Let's say 10 minutes a month on average. 10 minutes times 12 months is 120 minutes a year. That's two hours a year for everybody in your organization. You have 100,000 people in your organization, and there's a lot of people who have that. I'm just using that because the math works well. So you have two hours at 100,000 people each. So that's 200,000 hours worth of awareness training. People just sitting there taking mandatory videos. 200,000 hours. The average person has a 2,000-hour work year. So you stop looking at it that way. If you have 100,000 people, you have 100 people doing nothing but full-time every year watching mandatory awareness videos. Is there any problem with my math? Do you want 100 people a year watching mandatory videos as their full-time job? Because that's what you get with CBT training. You've got to be concerned about that. And I'm not saying that's there, but 100 people doing nothing but watching videos, if your job was a full-time watching videos, do you think you're going to absorb anything? No. So you got to understand, phishing and CBT are not awareness programs in and of themselves. I think, you know, again, the more passive and engaging the awareness is, the better. The goal is, again, not to force feed information and make 100 people a year do nothing but watch videos. The goal is to change people's behaviors. However you can do that in as many creative ways as possible is the ideal goal. But again, it's to create behavior. And here's how you have the culture life cycle. What happens is awareness, good awareness, creates user behaviors. User behaviors, in aggregate, create your culture. So in other words, when I was an NSA and I walked around and there was like a time, so I had to work on, one of my things, I had to work on like this plotter. We were working on maps and we had to like track something. I can't tell you what it was, but there was this plotter. And we had badges. And so my badge would be dangling. So when I had to work on this plotter with this arm going all over the place, I would take off my badge and then I would have to go out and go to the bathroom. And then I would go out, go to the bathroom, and if somebody saw me in the hallway and I forgot to put my badge back on, they would stop me. And then my coworkers would be sitting there and I would get back and they'd hide my badge, you know, sometimes. So what happened? The culture forced me to wear my badge. Yes, at some point I was told to wear the badge, 
but the fact that you walk around and see everybody else wearing a badge, it makes it a given. On the other hand, when I visit my customers, and I'm supposed to be the security expert, you know, but as a social engineer, awareness person, one of my prime responsibilities is to fit in. If I'm sitting there with a geeky little badge on and I'm the only person in the room wearing a badge, do you think I'm gonna wear that badge? No, even though I should, I can't. And that's the same with the average person. You have somebody new, they're all excited, they wear the suit like for the first three days and then they realize, why am I the only person wearing a suit? Everybody else is business casual. Some people are even in shorts and t-shirts like that Ira guy. So why am I wearing a suit every day? It's the same thing with security behaviors. You're gonna dress to your peers. You're gonna, likewise, you're gonna behave to your peers. So you gotta go ahead. But threat intelligence, again, makes awareness more useful, relevant, and creates intelligence, and so on. Um, let's see, are there any other things? Oh yeah, everybody subscribe to the robbery report. Ari and I have a webcast and stuff. We interview cool people, like the people, uh, like the anonymous people taking down ISIS. We interview the former director, deputy director of NSA talking about Snowden, that was a good one. Um, the John McAfee, he's a weird one. Uh, he's weird in a good way, actually. But um, his primary thing, uh, just to tell you, Matt, John McAfee's first day as president is to pardon all people in jail for marijuana-based offenses. So that's his platform. Anyway, um, so anyway, subscribe to the robbery report because we have a book coming out, Advanced Persistent Security, and that's our only way of contacting everybody, too. Um, if there are any questions, I will take them. Uh, uh, you are quicker. So. At what point is crying wolf uh, a, a, a question in this? When do you, does, that, does the question make a sense? Yeah. Okay. okay, so let me give you the biggest example I can. Because uh, ironically, I was writing a chapter on that, and the chapter was called Creating the Human... Um, creating the human intrusion detection system. And the thing is, your people should know exactly what to look for and be motivated to look for things. Because I look at it this way, you know, going back to 100,000 people, if you have 100,000 people in your organization, you should have 100,000 intrusion detection systems in your organization. So that's number one. Number two, you then get situations that are outright stupid sometimes. And the most absurd situation is the case of the mathematician who was thrown or, or they, wanted, they thought was a terrorist in Philadelphia because he, he, he was doing math. How many people heard that story? Yeah, the, the, there was, a, just so you know, the story goes, this woman was sitting on an airplane, and the guy next to her looked Arab, and he was writing something down that she didn't understand. Yeah, he, well, no, it's, it's irrelevant. Um, but he was writing something down she didn't understand. And then it turns out, he was not Arab, but Italian. He was a professor at University of Pennsylvania, mathematics professor, doing equations. I realize algebra has an Arabic origin, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily involved in terrorism. So that woman reported it. What happened? The woman got off the plane. The plane was delayed for two hours because they were investigating. Those people deserve to be shot. You know, because seriously, come down and think about it. Did the woman, we're telling everybody, look, the number one problem is, and, and here's the irony of the situation, the San Bernardino terrorists, there were some people there who said, these people are kind of weird, but I, you know, I don't want to accuse, be called a racist, you know, I, I don't trust them or something, but I don't, I don't want to get involved. There were some people who had those suspicions. Then what happened was, they turned out to be terrorists. So is it legitimate that people, if they are concerned, if they are so stupid and ignorant as hell that they don't know the difference between algebra and Arabic, you got to understand, they exist. But you don't want to have, you want to have a good warning system. However, that is the detection capability. You have detected data. Now you've detected data, let's compile this into information. But assuming it was even Arabic, I was writing Arabic. No, that's, that's a total, I'm getting to that. So then you have information. 
a, da a data point saying some woman is concerned about the person next to him. It should not take two hours for somebody to say, this woman is an idiot. <laughs> Seriously, whether he was writing Arabic, it's like, I'm sorry, is he somehow rubbing his pencil fast enough on the tray that it's going to set fire to the plane or something if he's writing Arabic? There's got to be some way in the reaction capability to evaluate intelligence quickly when you are in that environment. Now, not everything requires that level of quick interaction. However, you would suspect airport security, okay, who is there? We have a question about the gentleman in C4A. The gentleman in C4A, he's Italian, he's a University of Pennsylvania professor, He's a world-renowned mathematician, not likely a terrorist. Can we ask him, by the way, can I see your, <laughs> some, your writings that are somehow magically going to take down this plane? <laughs> and, I mean, it's like the woman, I swear. The, I mean, that person could have probably been speaking from England and she wouldn't have understood what they were saying, probably. So you got to understand, I mean, the reaction capability, sorry, I'm beating that point to death, but the issue is in crying wolf, the security department has to properly detect potential threats. They have to then go ahead and determine, are those potential threats, how is the best way to do that? Do we want to scare people? I use the example, scaring people into you know, being afraid to check their email. No. So you've got to go ahead and do things and have a response process that goes ahead and allows people to do that. Sorry. I was actually asking the kind of the reverse. If you, if you have a small organization and you're making, if you come out with a, an email or something you know, once a week or with the latest news story, won't you eventually get deaf ears on, uh, on the part of, the, of your company? Um, not if you do it properly. If you say, look, here are the issues. We are helping you interpret what's going on. So if you go ahead and say, you know what? There is not a big threat from the latest 117 million LinkedIn things. The how, because what you're doing is you're taking away the wolf. If you're saying, hey, you know what? If there is a wolf out there, don't go outside. You know, it's like what you're saying is, don't be afraid. If you're concerned about this, you should change your passwords on a regular basis no matter what. And this is ironically a great example of why you need to change your passwords on a regular basis. Because the threat, we're not saying be afraid and be paralyzed and not use the internet. We're saying here is the basic way to stop any basic threat. Yeah. Do you want to have to you, you put your hand down? So uh, I don't have enough incidents. I have port scans and phishing emails. And almost every illustration you use, they were phishing emails from the outside. So you just totally destroyed my phishing email training program. I say, hey, yeah, that's what I did. No before on that. And those are because mostly what I see as user interface is the phishing email. So mm -hmm. I try to train against that. Saying that though, I'm not saying that those were worthless. What I'm saying is, and again, it depends on the size of your organization, the personal engagement, because I can promise you, how big is your organization? You've got 50 people, three offices. Okay, you got 50 people in three offices. You know what's going to be infinitely more effective? You go out there once a month and you do a lunch and learn. Or you put out, here's a newsletter of the latest security threats. Because you can beat people up. And here's one of the big problems I hear with a lot of, so I try not to criticize other vendors. Um, beating people up with phishing email messages just because the data goes down and you send a phishing message out once every three weeks and it's the same UPS thing, the problem is you have to vary the sophistication of the message, you have to make it relevant. So for example, when I do, message, when I do a phishing campaign, I basically go ahead and decide if I'm going to start um, low, medium, or high sophistication, basically, and if I'm doing low, medium, or high sophistication, I try to use actual examples that the company might have fell for. And, I, and the difference in low, low is your UPS things, and frankly, the problem with low sophistication email messages, and here's one of my biggest issues with phishing emails since you're, you do this. What's the first thing you have to do to run a phishing simulation campaign? 
You probably aren't going to say this off the top of your head, but the first thing you got to do is whitelist the phishing messages. Mm -hmm. Right? What does that mean? It means those messages would never have got to the users in the first place. So you're testing them with messages that would have never got through to them. Totally serious. So that's flaw number one. But flaw number two is, okay, you constantly beat them up. You're like, hey, it's another damn phishing message from those security people. I'm really getting tired of it. Because it's like at some point there's overuse beating people down, and I know the vendors, and some vendors really like to say, keep fishing them, and I promise you we'll get down to zero or something close. And then it's like, well, why are you getting down to zero? Because they send the same phishing messages again and again, and they're tired of them, or some pseudo variation, or they just block the sender or something like that. And they finally get it down to zero, or they block the sender's domain. Some people are smart enough because they get tired. That's why they get down to zero. But at the same time, CBTs, are they good as a reminder? Do you want to see the people who are, I'm not going to say stupid, but are you going to see the people who just are naive enough not to learn? Yeah, but frankly, your best awareness program is going to be engaging with people, saying, look, I'm with security. Believe it or not, I'm here to help. Yes, phishing is a concern we have, and I need you to be aware of this. We have these phishing campaigns. We have messages that look like this, 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 and this. However, you need to be aware because this is a big problem. Because the problem with just sending phishing messages around there, it doesn't get the point across that that is the bane of your existence. If you just beat people up, you're beating them up and they keep getting the same, it's like, damn it, I just clicked on that stupid message again, I hate those people. <laughs> Instead of saying, you know what, I keep getting those messages. People keep clicking on it. People, let me step you through why this one worked and why not. Your engagement in an organization of 50 people is going to go much longer way than sending people, I'm assuming on the companies you're dealing with, probably sends out an average of, you know, give or take, 15 messages a year. Did I answer your question? You did answer the question. Okay. send out more. So if security, so it's really important, otherwise you have disgruntled employees as they're leaving, clicking on, on phishing messages. You have employees that feel that security is enemy clicking on phishing messages and they probably actually doing that quite deliberately. So that's kind of a delicate balance between security being your friend and security being uh, working from let's say power. And that quite is that pretty much what you said? Yeah, secure here's the big thing. Um, yeah this guy next I guess. Here's the big thing I, I try to tell people. I didn't mention it in this presentation. <coughs> But I did cover this at a high level. Security awareness is about telling people what are proper procedures and governance. Security should be the department of how, not the department of no. So as opposed to telling people, don't click on phishing messages, don't do this, don't go, you know, don't drag USB drives out, don't do this, don't do that. Security should be the department of how. You're going to open up an email. Here's how we want you to open up those emails. You know, you're going to go ahead, you're going to use USB drive. Here's the proper use of USB drives. You're going to go ahead, you're going to let people in behind you. If you let people in behind you, you need to see a badge. You need to ask them to swipe. Do I care why you're asking them to swipe? Do I care? Yes, there have actually been incidents of violence where former spouses have brought guns into the workplace. You can tell people that. But at the end of the day, you need them to know, and maybe you provide that along with what's the policy, and saying, well, here's the policy, and by the way, here's why we think it's important, because this happens. You know, we need to know that. But again, security needs to be the department of how, not the department of no, not the department of gotcha. So I'll just leave that to them. Anyway. So I agree with the whole how and don't be a gotcha person. I like that you're trying to tied into something that's timely and applies to more of this work, um, all that's great. But I, I find people don't retain, people don't learn, unless there's something that's kind of hands-on and practical and problem-solving. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring that into your security when training program? There's a combination of learn, hands-on, and everything. And like the first place I mentioned, like the one, one of the things I mentioned is, if everybody does it, everybody will do it like wearing the badge at NSA. So how do I get people like a game to learn? I shouldn't have to get people. 
Everybody's wearing a badge because everybody's wearing a badge. USB drives, people are not, I'm just using these as examples. You know, are people clicking on phishing messages and stuff? Um, it's, it's not easy. But again, there's, sorry, what's your question? I gotta make sure I live. I was going so off on I'm a tangent. I'm looking for how do I make this more practical and hands-on. Okay, so more practical and hands-on. Actually do the problem solving in their head of like, oh, this is the situation that I'm in and this is what I need to do. Right? Well, okay, so by the way, so what you need to do is you need to identify sample situations. In the first place, I would identify what are the policies and procedures you want people to do anyway. And then, in short, people know what are the policies and procedures you want people to do. Now, then the question is, how do we make sure it is embodied and put into practice? Now, like I mentioned, everybody at NSA does things because everybody at NSA does things. Snowden, who I'm not a fan of for many, 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 many reasons, nor should you ever be, because he is a traitor, and I'm, not, I'm leaving out the curses. And, anyway. But Snowden showed that he asked 25 people who received significant punishments because Snowden went up and asked them for their passwords. He said, I'm working on some project, um, I need your user ID and password. And what did he do? Because he was doing nothing right, he used their accounts to screw up, screw up and search information all over NSA. Because he knew he was doing wrong. So he went ahead and used their accounts to scour information. Now what happened was those people were rightfully punished. There should be, and frankly, people inside NSA know, you should never share your password with other people. And they were, some were fired, contracts were, if they were NSA employees, they were fired. If they were contractors like Snowden was, they were punished. Now, it's the same thing here. People need to know what is the right thing to do, and then you need to either bring in case studies if you see something that's a significant problem, or you need to find ways of doing, getting everybody to do the same thing. So for example, like one company had to start it having people wear badges. And that became a problem for them. Everybody has to wear a badge because they realize, hey, we're an airline. And airlines are supposed, everybody in an airport is supposed to wear a badge. And then they said, well, we are an airline in the corporate headquarters and we're all supposed to wear badges too. So they had to say, we are now part of the regulatory thing and they had to scare people. Is it great that you could do a game and stuff like that and figure out tactics? A lot depends on the size of the organizations you're dealing with. A 50-person company, honestly, is going to be easier than, you know, 50-person with three locations is going to be easier to implement a culture that gets everybody to do the right things. Yeah, but, if you can start, but if you can start influencing, there's what I call security champions. If you can get security champions, because there's ways of identifying the not decision makers, but influencers. Like I think there's one of these Malcolm Gladwell books or some other book called The Influencers. Or the, uh, I forgot the name, but if you can get the right people doing it and work to identify who those people are, those are people who are gonna get everybody to do it. Because we were doing an evaluation actually in an LA area company. And we were saying, so if we wanna get people, who do we ask for? They're like the CEO's secretary. If she does something, everybody does it. In another company, it was the woman who was like the office, like the, the office manager. If she wanted something, everybody started doing it. And then you figure out who are the people in different locations and work on those behaviors, because you're not going to magically do something, unless you have a major incident where somebody, for example, walks in with a gun and starts shooting people, you're not going to get significant changes, but you start figuring out who are the influences and working those people. Without an example, that's the best I can give you. Okay, well, hey, have M&M's and Diet Mountain Dew, huh? I guess there's a part. <laughs>